think we're good. Yep. Welcome everyone from New Zealand to the Arctic because we have listeners everywhere around the world. And uh, this is another one in our series produced by our office, uh, McGill Office for Science and Society, a uh, discussion about COVID-19 and uh, whatever other stuff may come up. Today, I have with me my colleagues, Jonathan Jerry, who has a background in molecular biology, Ada McVean, whose uh, background is chemistry, and uh, Dr. Debbie is not with us today. She's actually working an emergency room shift, doing a lot of good. But uh, we have a more than adequate replacement and we're keeping it in the family. Uh, let me introduce you to Dr. David Zlotnick, uh, who uh, is my son-in-law married to my other daughter, and uh, he's in Israel right now. They live in Israel, and he's the uh, chief medical officer for the Tarim uh, Emergency Care Clinics in Israel, but he's also on staff at the Jewish General Hospital here in Montreal, where he comes several times a year to, to work. So, uh, David, welcome, and um, we're going to have an uh, interesting insight here into what is happening uh, in your part of the world. So maybe we can start with that. Quickly fill us in on uh, your lockdown situation and uh, how Israel has uh, handled this. Sure. Thank you for having me, everyone. Um, so Israel, I would say, uh, is probably a few weeks ahead uh, on the curve uh, as opposed to Canada. Um, Israel right now is actually in a phase where we're starting to slowly ease restrictions, uh, very, very slowly. Israel start, started locking down quite early, actually, compared to other countries. Uh, very early on, we had uh, we closed down the airspace, uh, flights were stopped. Um, there were major like social, isola uh, social or physical isolation started, and uh, tracking of cases, which was uh, has still still going on actually now where there's really, uh, every time there's a, a positive patient, the patient's put into isolation, it's actually forced here uh, by law, and all the contacts are traced, and tracing the contacts has been a big part of the, uh, uh, the epidemiology here and trying to contain the pandemic. Um, all this started very, very early, and has left Israel in a pretty good situation, actually, uh, compared to other countries. Um, and now we're sort of, I would say, maybe three weeks ahead of where you guys are in Montreal, um, and starting to think about easing restrictions. Uh, we're still quite um, contained. Um, by law, we're all, we all must be within, or for the last month at least, we've been all, about 100 meters from our house. That's all we've been allowed uh, movement, unless, of course, you're an essential worker or you need medical care or grocery shopping or any of the essential uh, needs. Uh, but otherwise, 100 meters from the house. I know, so there's a fact that you're running, right? You're running back and forth. That uh, hundred meter route. Yes, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Home workouts have become uh, much more popular. Well, and, the uh, uh, the mortality rate in Israel is significantly lower than elsewhere, right? You're below one percent, I think. About, we're about, I would say, maybe the about one percent or a little bit lower than one percent. Uh, there's, you know, like many things, that's probably multifactorial. Uh, we, you know, we have a relatively young population, um, and again. We, they did a pretty good job of flattening that curve with the uh, social distancing or physical distancing and with the and with the epidemiology of the contact tracing. And all that together, I think, has left us, and, and again, of course, closing down the airspace is quite early, has left us with a pretty good, um, uh, you know, a, a, in a pretty good situation. Well, we have all kinds of issues, of course, that uh, arise. And uh, people are still, of course, uh, fixated on disinfecting everything that they touch. And, uh, of course, there's value in that. But there also have some risks that have arisen. Uh, we've had a story about a lady who wanted to wash her produce. So she took a bucket and put bleach into it and thought, well, maybe that's not enough. So she poured in some vinegar. And, uh, of course, the next thing that uh, she realized that she was choking because if you take bleach, which is calcium hypochlorite, and mix it with vinegar, acetic acid, you generate chlorine gas. And she ended up in the hospital with uh, uh, chlorine toxicity. So this is something that you have to be very careful with. You do not mix bleach with any kind of acid. You don't mix it with Windex either, because you can get chloramines, which are also highly toxic. So I think this is something to keep in mind. Uh, yes, disinfecting is important, but you want to make sure you don't mix things that should not be mixed. 
Another thing that has emerged, of course, is all the conspiracy theories, and, and there are loads and loads uh, of them out there. But one that, that is, is gaining more and more traction is the notion that the 5G technology, which is, is being introduced, is somehow interfering with people's immune system. And this is something, Jonathan, I know that you've been looking into. So maybe a, a quick synopsis of, of that situation. Sure. I mean, it's it's it makes no scientific sense. I mean, let's just go go straight to, to the answer there. Uh, but but it has gained a lot of traction from people like David Icke, who is a an infamous uh, conspiracy theorist. Uh, and basically, some people are are, are trying to blame. These, these cell phone signals, uh, the, this new generation of cell phone signals, uh, which is more powerful than the previous generation. And we've seen this whenever there's, there's been a rollout for uh, a new generation of cell phone signals. When there was 3G, there were some people who were worried. When there was 4G, same thing, and now 5G. The difference now, of course, is that they've always... They've always feared that something would happen when we turn on that switch. Of course, there's, there's no one switch. Different countries, you know, uh, will roll this out at, diff at different times. But now, of course, COVID-19 happened at around the same time that 5G was being rolled out. And so some people are thinking, aha, correlation. It must be that one causes the other. And so the, 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 the most coherent theory that I've seen, which, again, is completely unscientific, is that 5G is stressing our cells uh, and, and our cells in response are producing these exosomes or these little, these, these little bubbles. Um, and that is what scientists are, are, are thinking is the virus. Uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, first of all, these uh, the, the radiation itself, I mean, the word radiation is, is a very loaded term. It is so low in energy and there's no known mechanism for, for how it could be affecting us. It is orders of magnitude uh, less energetic than visible light itself. Uh, so there have been a lot of studies showing basically that it, it is essentially harmless unless it is really concentrated as you would in a microwave oven. And the other thing also is that, you know, this idea that we're, we're mistaking uh, exosomes for the virus makes no sense. I mean, we have sequenced the entire uh, genome of this coronavirus. We know that we this is not a sequence that we have in our cells. We know what the sequence codes for. So it is it is unfortunately it's, it's completely ludicrous. Uh, but it it I mean, some people are using that to blame uh, to, to blame 5G technology. And some telecommunications masts in Europe are on fire because some people think they are blaming these uh, telecommunications units on the pandemic, which is absolutely horrific. Well, we know that the science behind it is, is pseudoscience. It's absurd. <laughs> but I think we can also dismiss this whole nonsense just by looking at where the 5G technology has indeed been introduced and where it has been. Yeah. So Iran, for example, where, of course, they have a huge number of cases, there's no 5G there. And uh, many, many places where there's no 5G have high incidence rates. So this is nonsense, not even worth talking about uh, anymore. But there are many conspiracy theorists out there who, who push this agenda. Okay, Ada, you like animals of all sorts and then connections to disease, etc. And last time we talked about the tigers in the Bronx Zoo that were infected. What's uh, the update on that? Well, it turns out there's actually a few more tigers, um, seven more, in fact, tigers and lions that have been infected. Um, there's still no evidence that they're necessarily passing it to each other. Um, that's obviously tricky to know, but the original theory is that it came from an asymptomatic zookeeper. Um, but on the smaller animal side of things, there were actually two new cats in New York City, domestic cats, um, that were diagnosed with covid and it's really, I mean, it's, it's sad. I hope these cats make a full recovery, but it's really interesting in helping us learn a lot about how this disease progresses because we've seen that in one of the cases with the cats, the owner who was in the house with them had COVID. So it seems like perhaps the cat caught it from the human. But in the other hand, um, with the other cat, there was nobody that they were in contact with who had the coronavirus. So it could have been caught from an asymptomatic carrier. If they were an indoor outdoor cat, it could have been caught from anybody out there. Um, but we have seen that at least in one of these households, um, there were two cats living together, but only one of them got it. So it does not seem like cats can pass it to each other. And there's no evidence whatsoever that they can pass it back to humans. So, well, you should be the official CDC recommendation is to quarantine pets with you if you are quarantining and to keep pets away from you. If you think that you are positive, let somebody else care for them if that's an option for you. But there has been this rash of animals being abandoned or even worse killed because of fears that they could contract corona or spread it, transmit it to other people, and they're just completely unfounded. Um, I, I really worry every time I see a media headline, you know, something like 
two cats positive for coronavirus in New York City. I just imagine how many people start thinking about, hmm, how much do I really like my cat? Should I get rid of them? And animal shelters are really suffering right now. I know because I volunteer at one. They don't have enough volunteers and they're having to deal with the same social distancing issues we all are. There's also no PPE for them either. So right now the shelters do not need um, an increase of abandoned animals. So your, your pet will probably be okay even if they do catch it and it's pretty unlikely that they will catch it. So keep your cat away from you if you think you're sick, but do not get rid of your cat because you're scared I, I will, of corona. I will say, though, I will say the dogs have nothing to do with the coronavirus at all. So once again, prove that dogs are superior to cats. That's true. We have no evidence that dogs can even be infected, even in, like, laboratory situations. They're good boys. <laughs> They're very good boys. How many questions I have had from people who walk their dogs about whether or not they should allow the dog that they're walking to interact with another dog that is being walked. No. And uh, of course they're concerned about the virus being transferred. Well, there's no transfer of the virus in the sense as they just mentioned. Of course, there's always the outside possibility that someone who has the virus on their hands will have petted the dog and then it can be transferred to the other animal and then you touch it your face, etc. But these are far-fetched uh, uh, theories. Anyway, last night watching TV, I can't tell you how many times a commercial came up from a, a vitamin manufacturer. And uh, what they were pushing, vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. Now, of course, they were not referring to COVID at all, but they had plenty of words about the immune system. You want to make sure that your immune system is, is uh, active. So the David, what do you say about uh, all of these supplements uh, that are being promoted to, quote, boost the immune system? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of questions about that here. And, you know, whether it be immune, you know, vitamin supplements or, or diet or exercise or all these things. And, uh, you know, like I say, that's all great for you. I'm not sure how much it's going to boost your immune system against uh, catching, you know, the COVID virus. But, uh, you know having a healthy lifestyle and eating well and sleeping well and exercise and all that stuff is great. Uh, you know, but, uh, I, I don't think any evidence has shown that there's any, you know, sort of, you know, vitamin or, or, or combination that will help, you know, boost your immune system enough that it'll stop the transmission of the viral. The one that is really being pushed is vitamin C. And uh, there are a lot of people who say that we should be using intravenous vitamin C, high doses, 25 grams, you know. And, and uh, there are actually some clinical studies in China that have examined this. Uh, I haven't seen any favorable results. But there are many people on the Internet who are, are pushing this. And uh, there are a lot of people who I know are taking large doses of vitamin C orally, hoping to prevent the disease. Well, up to 1,000, 2,000 milligrams is not much problem there. But you can get diarrhea, a significant diarrhea, if you start uh, overdosing uh, on, on vitamin C. Now, vitamin D is a bit of a different story because there is actually a bit more evidence that uh, vitamin D plays a role in, in, in the immune system. But again, I, I think it is really being uh, uh, just overplayed. And then, of course, we have the whole story of uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And uh, as, uh, you know, North Americans were to told uh, over and over again, what harm can it do? Try it. And this, of course, was by the prophet of uh, the coronavirus, who happens to be sitting in the Oval Office in, uh, in Washington, uh, who, of course, has zero background, but he was pushing these two drugs. And uh, there are people, of course, who need these drugs for conditions for which they're indicated, like lupus. And now we're hearing that there's not enough of the drug for people who really need it because it's being hoarded by people who think that this can uh, protect them. And just yesterday, we had another study that came out uh, from Veterans Hospital in New York, in, in Washington, showing that really both hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine were not effective. And in fact, perhaps we're even causing more deaths. So yeah. uh, in Israel, what's what's happening with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine? So I think it was a similar uh, possible, you know, sort of trajectory where initially there was a small study, I believe it came out of France, if I remember correctly, that initial study was a French study uh, that sort, sort of showed some possible benefit. And of course, when you have nothing to treat something with, so you grasp onto any kind of science that you'll find, and the numbers are quite small, I think, and, you know, 
not enough to to be a truly good great study but you know people saw some sort of trend and said we'll try it and you, you know you're right you know if it can't do any harm you know yeah. let's oh, try well, it I'll, I'll Trump Sorry? Was quite, we're finding out that Trump was actually quite wrong when he said it can't yeah. do any harm. It, yeah, it's certainly I, I also, yeah, there were also some cases of people overdosing. We invite your questions. If anyone has any questions, you can type them in and Emily will forward them uh, yeah, to us. I have, um, we have some questions about I, I, Legault's, in, in Legault's announcement today about herd immunity and uh, basically loosening restrictions and getting kids back to school and what that means. and. Um, Someone says, or they ask if, uh, well, first of all, a two-parter, uh, isn't herd immunity effective only above rates of 90 to 95%? That's one of the questions. And the other one was, um, does the science allow us to begin lifting the restrictions and sending kids back to the classroom? David, do you want to talk about herd immunity? Uh, I, you know, herd immunity, I think 90% is a bit high. Uh, from what I was reading, herd immunity shows effectivity of, uh, about 60% you're around there. Um, and, you know, I guess that sort of goes back to the question we were discussing before about flattening the curve and what that really means. And does flattening the curve mean we're going to prevent people from getting the, uh, the virus? Maybe, but maybe not. And maybe it's just, you know, flattening the curve means letting it happen over time so that your uh, the rate of uh, of the infection is is less, and that way you're buying time. A you know what we've all heard, so we don't overwhelm the system, the healthcare system, like what happened in Italy. I mean, what happened in Italy was multifactorial, but but also to give us time to build up some sort of herd immunity and, and possibly even find a, a, a treatment or a vaccine. Um, so you know that's sort of where we are in is in Israel now, in a sense that uh, certainly there's not enough herd immunity yet, but we're starting to ease restrictions, sort of because we've clamped down. When you clamp down and do a lot of isolation and tracking and all this kind of thing, so you sort of stop that initial uh, exponential rate of of rise of the virus, and now when you sort of let it out slowly, of course you're expecting to see a, a spike in, in cases, but the question is, can you isolate that spike? That's really what where the countries that have done this well. Uh, like South Korea, um, for example, that's a big example people always give. Where, where when they, you know, when you're opening things up and you're letting things happen, you're you're tracking people, you're isolating the cases, you're isolating their contacts once they have it, and you're really, and in that way, you're l allowing the immunity to build up slowly and surely instead of having a whole uh, crisis and, and another, you know, a huge spike or a second wave, as they call it. Um, so that's sort of the thought process of how this is supposed to happen, uh, doing it slowly, surely, but. I think the the if you're looking at other countries who have done this ahead of us, uh, really where they were strong and where I believe I'm not sure. I mean, Canada uh, definitely the United States isn't as as like the contact tracing. Like if you're going to do this and and open things up and and you know let the herd immunity again start, you also have to be able to isolate very quickly those who who have the uh, the virus and to track them. And that's sort of the balance that you're they're going for. Of course, the, the term herd immunity may not be familiar to, to a lot of people, <clears throat> but what it really means is that there's enough of a uh, high enough percentage of the population who for some reason have already become immune, then the rest of the people are less likely to get it because there are fewer people to get it from. And of course, the best way to develop herd immunity is through vaccination. Unfortunately, we don't have the vaccine yet uh, for for this, and uh, it isn't clear that we ever will. You know that I mean, it's a good guess that we will, but there's no guarantee that a vaccine here will ever be uh, developed. But but uh, you know, obviously, there are a lot of companies that are are working on that. Uh, but vaccination is the ultimate way of developing uh, herd immunity. Now, in Sweden, of course, they they have uh, taken a different approach, and uh, they don't have to shut down. And uh, they think that uh, if naturally enough people will get the disease and recover from it, then you get herd immunity. But their statistics don't look all that good. There are a lot of people in Sweden who are who are dying. Their mortality rate is about yeah, almost about about I would say about eight times what we have here in Israel, for example. Right. Uh, their mortality rate is much higher. Again, you know, the elderly, especially in the uh, older age homes and the elderly population uh, is dying at a rapid rate. Whereas again, in countries where you're, uh, you know, isolating more, not allowing that to happen, you're hoping to spread that over time, so you'll build up some kind of herd immunity or have some kind of treatment or something, so that you can prevent that spike of death uh, or mortality rate. 
Um, Things are changing so quickly. Uh, last last week we talked about this uh, report from China, where they examined people on a bus, and there was one one person on the bus sitting at the back of the bus who was known to be uh, COVID positive, and that people at the front of the bus got the disease, even though they were much further away than the two meters that we talk about. Well, today that study was retracted, and they don't say why it was retracted. So this is, you know, this is just the evolving situation. People are, are doing stuff, and they're throwing it out there prematurely. And that bus story got a lot of publicity around the world because it suggested that, you know, this could be traveling 30 feet, and, you know, that scared everyone. Uh, that could lead us into the discussion about masks. <laughs> oh, I well, this is the question. So we have a question yeah. about masks, but it's actually a very good one um, because now masks are pretty much, we're probably going to have to start wearing them and many more people will, whether it's by law or choice. Um, someone said, is there any, uh, what should we look for in buying a face mask? Um, any specific material? Someone saw one that has filters that need to be changed every time we wear it. Um, and also about face shields, which I've also seen more. Um, are they yeah. effective? Uh, so, uh, you know, um, face masks is kind of a controversial topic because initially the, the WHO and everyone were, were saying not to wear face masks and that there's no need and that all that stuff. And that sort of changed a bit in different countries. You know, countries in Israel, initially they said uh, no one needs to wear face masks. Uh, and now it's actually a law. It's been a law for a few weeks already where you have to wear a face mask and it's actually you can be fined um, X amount of money if you're not found without one. And and even with jail time the second time. So here it's actually a law. You have to wear a face mask if you're in a public place, not if you're, you know, just, you know, you're, you're allowed to go, for example, for a run within your few hundred meters of your house. Uh, but, but any kind of public place or you went shopping or anything, you know, if you're going to the grocery store, you have to wear a face mask. Um, you know, when you're talking about the face mask with the filters, and, and I think that might be for the general public a bit of overkill. You're talking about the N95 mask, and those are really for healthcare providers who are up in the face of people who are positive, um, and that le level of protection is not uh, really necessary for the general public. You know, I may have, I have N95 when I'm at work sometimes, but, you know, when I go shopping, uh, I'll just wear a basic surgical mask, for example. I just those are easy to, to come by here. So, you know, those surgical masks are, are, are fine. And even that you don't need really, you know, uh, people are you now manufacturing masks, homemade masks, anything that really blocks the droplets is what you're talking about, the aerosolized droplets. And you don't really need a super high, um, you know, level mask for that. And, you know, so people are made just the reg regular uh, cloth, uh, especially if it's like a few ply or, or you know, there's all, uh, all kinds of formulas on the on the internet about how to make these these masks and, and comparisons of different materials, and it turns out that just ordinary t-shirt material is actually quite good. It will get rid of 60 to 70 percent of the droplets. What is also uh, really very good is the material that vacuum cleaner bags are made out of, and it's possible to formulate a mask uh, out of that. But uh, I, I think you, you, you don't have to go overboard with this because the whole idea is to stop large droplets and yeah. virtually any material will, will do that. There's also, with the N95, there's also the question of how you re-sterilize them. And there was a study that just came out, interestingly enough, that if you just put it in the oven at 170 degrees Fahrenheit for an hour, uh, it's, it's fine. And it doesn't affect the rubber, it doesn't affect the mass material. The question though is, if you suspect that your mask is, is contaminated, uh, how are you going to handle this before you put it into the oven? But again, that, this is for health professionals. This is not for uh, for the average person. Ada, you put on a mask when you go out? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, mostly because I did. Like, I, wa I was tested positive for corona, completely recovered, but I was worried, obviously, about infecting others. And as we know, masks are more about protecting others from you than they are about protecting you from others. So I've been very careful to try to wear a mask whenever I can, even though I hypothetically shouldn't be um, infectious anymore. But how Jonathan, long? Jonathan, you wear a mask? Uh, not yet, but I've changed my mind this week. Uh, I rarely go out as it is. I keep my distances, but I think just to be extra safe, yeah. Okay, Emily, another question. Well, uh, yes, but I also just have a question. I think we asked this last week to uh, to Debbie as well. But you know, Ada is recovered now. Um, how long until she feels safe going out? You know, I can't and not hear you. 
Very hard to, sorry, I really can't hear you. One second. Technical difficulties. Is it better now? Right. Yep. Better yeah. now. Still, I don't know. There's still problems with my mic. I'll talk loud. Um, how long until Ada will feel actually, or we will feel safe being around her, um, you know, until she is non-infectious, even though technically it's supposed to be two weeks? Really I depends never, I never feel at. safe around her. Yeah, I think Jonathan will fear me forever now. So I, I, I'm actually not sure how it works uh, uh, there with that, you know, but in, in Israel, when you are tested positive, you have to, you're into forced isolation either in your house or at a, what they call, what they have these hotels that are now, you know, that they, that positive patients can go to, especially if a big family don't want to infect everyone. And the only way you're allowed out of isolation, either home isolation, hotel or hospital, wherever you are, is by two negative tests. After, you have to be asymptomatic uh, for X number of days. Then you have to have t two negative tests 48 hours apart. And only then are you allowed out of isolation. So they're much, they're, they're more strict, I guess, with the criteria yeah. for, yeah, yeah. Probably uh, so due you, to, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just probably due to the testing shortage. They, um, I, I actually asked if I should get another test to confirm that I had recovered. Um, but they said, because I, I mean, even by the time I had the first test, I was already recovered from what I thought was the flu. So because um, I wasn't experiencing any symptoms, they said they'd rather keep the tests for people to diagnose them, which makes sense. Um, I was told 14 days from the day before the start of my symptoms. Um, but there was some debate because I lost my sense of smell and they weren't sure whether to count that as the start of my symptoms or not. So we went with the start of my more flu-like symptoms as opposed to my smell, which I lost about a week before. Um, but even still, I'm, I'm well done that. It's been about a month since then now. Um, so even even though without the two tests, I'm pretty sure I'm not symptomatic anymore or infectious anymore, but you can never be too careful. It's interesting to see the difference in the two countries where it would actually be illegal in Israel to, to leave isolation without having the two, ne two negative tests. Mm -hmm. Which is also interesting about this like next phase we are talking about before about the herd immunity and another a lot of you know science is, and is and uh, in the literature they're talking about mass testing. You've heard that a lot, and that's sort of part of the reason. If you're going to let people out and start loosening restrictions, so everyone's pushing for mass testing, that allows you to find asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic uh, carriers and isolate them early uh, before they spread it, and also to find people who have the have it and to find that they're actually negative. So there is like there's some, there is actually a lot of literature and talk uh, going forward about uh, mass testing, and that uh, may be the next wave of the future wherever it's possible. And I had something interesting just come up because <clears throat> I just did an interview on TV about morticians and their risks and why it is that that funerals are okay that is caskets can be put into the ground but not into crypts. This I, I did not understand where this is, and I, I coming from, I still don't understand, but the Cuba government has said that you cannot put bodies in, into crypts. Now, as far as I'm concerned, we have to be scared of the living, not of the dead. Uh, I think that morticians uh, uh, do have some concerns when they're preparing the body, because it's possible that if they push on, on the chest cavity, and uh, some air will be expelled from the body and that can harbor uh, viruses. So they have to have the proper protective equipment. But once you've put the, the body into a, a casket, I just can't think of any reason why there should be a difference between putting that into a crypt or putting it in, into the ground. Can any of you think of any reason why this, this could be? Uh, I, it just seems to be a bizarre sort of uh, recommendation. Uh, and, uh, you know, even even the idea that, that uh, inside of the coffin, the body has to be put into two body bags, I, I don't quite follow that. I mean, even, you know, first of all, this virus needs a living cell in order to replicate. It's not going to replicate in that dead body. And it's not going to, to go out of the body into the ground and jump into our face. So, uh, so sometimes some of these... Uh, Recommendations, I think, are, are somewhat overbearing and don't really have a big justification. So, Interesting question, though, and Jonathan might know the answer, is how long after death, in the brain death or heart death sense of it, do your, is every single one of your cells dead, though? Because it's certainly not going to be instantaneous. 
No, it's not instantaneous, but I mean, the, the, the virus requires, you know, harnessing your cell machinery like your ribosomes and all that to make copies of itself. So I, I, I don't think, you know, I don't see how a dead body would be able to uh, to be infectious in that way for, for very long after death. I mean, I, I'm not an expert at this. Maybe the, the true answer will surprise me. Uh, but I think fairly fa fairly quickly, it's a body is no longer a viable, uh, you know, source of, of contagion in, well, in, in, that, in that respect. As soon as respiration stops, I mean, when the cells don't get oxygen, I mean, that's that's it. They're, yeah. they're, they're kaput. So I, I don't think that, that uh, there's going to be much replication of virus in, in, in a dead body. But, uh, I mean, is all, all of these concerns that come up. But, you know, something, as, as our listeners know, I mean, we are really fixated on separating sense from nonsense. That really is the, the motto of our office and separate fact from fiction. So... It, it's really the dissemination of false information that, that really gets us aggravated. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of aggravated by one guy, uh, Shiva Ayadurai, who's an Indian, uh, Indian origin. But, but uh, the reason that this guy really um, is annoying is because he's a legitimate scientist. He's got a number of degrees. He's got a PhD in, in systems biology. And uh, he has the most incredible... Uh, conspiracy theories out there. He's one of these who believes that Bill Gates wants to thin out the population. And he uh, also has a theory, which I've not heard from anyone else. Uh, social isolation, he says, is what is causing the problem. Because if you're socially isolated, this is what ramps down your immune system. Because you're not contacting anyone, so your immune system doesn't have to be uh, active. And uh, he, of course, thinks that uh, Dr. Fauci is uh, a messenger from the deep state, that the deep state has planted him. And uh, his purpose is, is, is again, to, to uh, just uh, promote the deep state and uh, uh, somehow cause the economy to collapse so that the elite can benefit. And this is the guy who, who is out there. He's got a huge number of, of, of viewers on his, his uh, podcast. He's running for, as, uh, uh, for a Senate position in the next election, and he talks a very good game. This is what's troublesome. When you have someone who sounds very scientific and is spewing out total pseudoscience, but it sounds very reasonable to someone who is not well conversed in, in science. So I don't often like to give a voice to these people, but uh, I think it's also important to point out that, that you have... Numerous degrees, you can sound very intelligent and uh, still be totally off the mark. Let's, can, we, can we go to some of our questions on Facebook and yes. YouTube? Okay, so um, one, one of them is looking at um, basically if someone is uh, diagnosed with corona and then they go home and they have a family at home um, and their family can't really go anywhere. I mean, how do you recommend that scenario? Or how do you recommend living in that scenario? So, right, so that's a very common thing that happens here a lot. And uh, so people who were diagnosed with corona, again, here had the option of going to actually to a hotel to be admitted until they were negative, so they don't infect their family. But people who were at home with corona, and there are, um, were basically told to sort of isolate themselves in their home. And that meant we had all, a whole list of uh, recommendations by the health ministry here in Israel, but that basically meant be in your own well-ventilated room, uh, separate from your family, uh, if you need to go even like to the washroom, if you can't, if it'd be then obviously if you have your own washroom within the room, like a master bedroom, that's great. But if if not, as some small apartments here don't, then you can use the same use use the same bathroom as your family. Wear a mask as you're going out into the hallway, into the bathroom, wash down the bathroom, uh, your clothes as a fomite, fomite, you know, like a surface that can carry the the virus in garbage bags, put it in a laundry by itself or whatever. They had all these recommendations, you know, obviously hand washing and but basically isolating oneself within one's home. Uh, until they were tested negative or, you know, here was, was what they were doing. What, what do you do when you come home and you've seen patients all day? Yeah. You come home, what's the first thing you do? Well, it starts before I get home. <laughs> and uh, uh, Debbie, you're right, my, my sister-in-law and Joe's daughter, <laughs> uh, does the same. We, we converse about this. We actually have the same kind of procedure that we do after our shift, which is very, you know, I actually bring a set of clean clothes with me uh, to work. At work, I take off my scrubs and my dirty clothes, put them in a, a, a bag, uh, close that up, 
put on my clean, wash my hands, of course, between every step of this way, put on my clean clothes, um, leave every, uh, wash down all my stethoscope and all my equipment and leave that in the car in a different bag that's after it's been cleaned. Uh, when I come home, I don't come home through the main door anymore. I call my wife, Lisa, Joe's other daughter, and say, please open the back door for me <laughs> from the garden. And, I, I, <laughs> and so I don't see anyone, none of the kids or anyone like that. Before I come home, I go through the back door. I, at the door, take off the clean clothes as well, put them in the same bag, uh, put that as a straight line, to beeline to the laundry room, stick that into the, into the washing machine without seeing or touching anyone, and then right into the shower. <laughs> so... That's sort of my my new, as they call, doffing. The COVID routine. The well, COVID. I mean, you have a real reason to do this because it's very possible to have gotten some virus on your on your clothes. So, Ada and Jonathan, you take any any precautions like that when you go out? Um, I've been just wiping everything down. I have a bleach solution, uh, four tablespoons and one liter of water that I've just been wiping everything down with when I come in the front door and I do change my clothes, but that's also partially because I spend all my time in pajamas and only put on real clothes when I have to leave the house. So I want to take them off as soon as I get home anyways. Um, and if I was outside for kind of, if I was going to shower that day anyways, I'll go straight to the shower. But if I just showered, then it just doesn't seem worth it to me. And Jonathan, you don't go out enough to worry. No, I mean, I, my routine hasn't changed since the beginning. So, I mean, I keep my outside shoes by the door. I keep my uh, my outside clothes by the door. I mean, I mean, my, my jacket. Uh, and I wipe everything down that I bring inside uh, before I do. So, you know, that's basically what I do. You know, uh, you know, obviously, these days, all discussion is about COVID. Uh, but there are people now who are, are trying to bring in other topics in, in connection, though. Uh, papers are coming out about so-called endocrine disruptors. And this is something that, you know, we at the office deal with all the time. Uh, the chemicals that supposedly have hormone-like effects, uh, estrogenic effects, things that leach out from plastics, from, from nonstick cookware. And, but the, the people who have vested interest in that theory now are suggesting that because we have not paid enough attention to endocrine disruptors, this is what has weakened our immune system, and this is why COVID is getting a, a foothold. Now, the reason I mention this is because I, I find it so interesting that researchers get so uh, taken up by their work that they think that it is critical in every other aspect of, of life, you know? So these people who, who have for years done research on, on endocrine disruptors, now all of a sudden, are, are jumping on the bandwagon that this is why we have the, the COVID. And then, I mean, I, you know, this, this is a pretty big leap. But it's, it's interesting during the, uh, during the 1918 flu pandemic. Yes, <laughs> exactly. You know, like how, how researchers get so, so uh, embedded in, in, in their research uh, and that they, they try to link it to uh, absolutely everything. Okay, another question, Emily? Um, can you guys hear me right now? Yes. Okay. Cause uh, let me know again if you can't. Okay. Um, a few questions about, um, getting infected getting twice. Infected. Getting reinfected. Getting reinfected. Reinfected. Yeah. You know, I keep seeing I'm highly relevant to my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We keep seeing case reports of this, and uh, it seems like it's not very convincing. I, I mean, it's very unlikely to get reinfected. Um, you know, just it's just not the you know. Listen, this is the novel coronavirus, and you know, like this is a new uh, something new. But but you know, if it takes you know, if you look at every other virus, once you you're uh, once you're infected and you get your antibodies and your immunity. I kind of find it hard to believe, and they've looked back at these cases and said maybe there was a false a false negative at a test or some other, you know, reason, but it, it seems to be very uh, unlikely that uh, people can get reinfected, although it's possible, like, you know, I guess anything's possible, it is possible, but uh, again, these have been very, very few case reports, and, and super, not super uh, convincing, from what I understand. There's a lot of work now on extracting antibodies from plasma, <clears throat> plasma taken from people who have been infected, and using this to, to treat infected patients with some success. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, something that I, I've thought about, and, and uh, maybe one of you guys knows the answers to this, why can you not infect animals with the, uh, with the virus? And they should also develop antibodies and use those antibodies. Is there any reason to not do that? I mean, do animals not develop antibodies to the virus? They do, but antibodies are species specific, right? Yeah. So, uh, for example, when we were starting to develop therapeutic drugs that were based on antibodies, uh, they didn't work all that well because they were often from from mice. They were murine antibodies, and so there are ways of humanizing them in a sense. And you can do some genetic recombination to have a little bit of the mouse, a little bit of the human, and all that. Uh, but you can't just take an antibody from a, from an animal and give it to a human being. So you you think that. This is not an area that is uh, worth looking at at all. I mean, this is not, they're not doing this. Uh, I mean, what about primates? You know, if you... Uh, I, I don't know enough about primate biology to, to know if what, what the immunocompatibility is between our two species. Uh, I do know that they are working with some, uh, with some monkeys. Uh, I know that they have infected some of them to see, uh, to see, to see what happens and all that, but... Um, I, I, I don't know what would be the potential benefit of taking antibodies from a monkey and putting this into a human being. I mean, I, I, I doubt that it would be that simple. Yeah. Another drug that's being looked at is ivermectin, which is an antiparasitic uh, drug. And again, this is based on in vitro experiments, which means that in the laboratory, in a Petri dish, you can show that it has some antiviral activity. And again, uh, you know, this is being hyped on some internet sites, and um, uh, there's no human clinical uh, evidence. We need the trials on, on this. Okay, Emily. Yeah, so um, I have two good questions I'd like to get to, um, both different, but I'm going to say them now so I don't forget them. One is about the treating and wearing of face masks. I think we should talk a little bit about that, and I know that there are some instructional videos starting and more from uh, provincial governments, but how to wear, how to discard, um, when to wash, you know, people think that getting one is sufficient, it's not. So maybe you could just talk about that. And then also, um, um, oh, this is one about estrogen levels and uh, how that can really minimize uh, COVID-19 severity. So would consuming estrogen of phytoestrogen foods help or hurt? And are there any studies in the works? Both very different. <laughs> Let me get started. Okay, I think I can answer that one. The yeah. phytoestrogens have absolutely no relation to, to COVID. Forget this one way or another. This, 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 this comes from the endocrine disrupting argument, but it's just not uh, applicable here. Now, as far as masks, so if it's a cloth mask, you just launder it. You, you, you wash it. And so, but I guess it's more the surgical mask that people may concern them because they may have one or two of these. Yeah. Infinite number and how to reuse it. So what do you say? To be honest, as opposed to like the N95 mask, you know, they say you could also like the same thing in the oven or, or this or that, but I don't think, I haven't seen anything, any strong literature about reusing it or not reusing it. Again, it's to, it's to drop, it's to, you know, if you're sick and you're wearing it because you're actually sick, then I obviously wouldn't reuse it. Um, but if you're, you know, you're using it to stop droplets or you're asymptomatic, you're just using it for protection out, you know, so, you know, I think, you know, using it a few times or, or it's not the biggest deal. So if it's, um, like, if it's like, I have a cotton mask, I have one, me and my husband, we, we have one each, we go out to the, well, we went to the bank, we wore it, we came back, we can't just put it, on it. Our, we can't just put it on our table, you know, beside our car keys to like use again when we go out tomorrow. Right. right? Oh, so yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So, I mean, like in, in, in general, people like use it and wash it. But, you know, if you're wearing a mask, it doesn't mean that you should not maintain the two-meter distance. For so sure. let's say you've been out with the mask, do your grocery shopping or whatever, you come home. What is the chance that that mask has some virus on it? I, it's almost zero. Very low. Just, yeah, the same, the same way people are, I mean, I, tons of people are, are getting groceries and washing them down. And I'll be honest, I mean, I'm not really, when I get groceries, I'm not really disinfecting every grocery I get. I mean, the, the way you think about it is, you know, when we're talking about how long viruses live on surfaces, you're talking about laboratory studies and ideal conditions. But, you know, when you're taking a, going to the, sh to, to the shop and bringing groceries home in a bag and jostling it around and bumping it around and putting it down, I mean, you have to have a significant viral load surviving on that surface, then surviving on your hand touching it, 
and then somehow get it right into that, that amount into your respiratory tract. Right. So somehow, wash your hands stops that. You, you know, stop, you wash your hands. I mean, I'm not sitting there scrubbing my bananas or whatever. You know, when, when you buy that, but I just don't think I just that's not really how this virus is is you know is propagated. That's just not that's not 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 the way. I mean, not like you know, it's not what happened. It's not how you get infected. Is it absolutely Thanks. impossible? Thanks. Probably not. But this I mean, it's very labile to heat. That's for sure. But it loves cold. So in the refrigerator, if you have any any kind of uh, food that that may have virus on it, and you put it in your refrigerator, there it can live a long time. In the freezer, it can live for years. So you know you want to be more careful about food that you're going to put into the fridge than what you leave outside, because on the outside, probably after a day, even if there was virus on it, that virus is going to be inactivated. Well, Emily, I will make a, I will make just a point about wearing the mask and about <laughs> because I would say I walk around the street, you know, I walk, I see people 60, 50, 60 percent of the time people have it under their nose. <laughs> so if you're going to wear the mask, you have to cover your nose. because That's just useless. And like I, I, I see it. people are excellent, are really well protected. Their chins, their chins are wonderfully protected. I don't know how many people not get chin COVID, but everywhere else it's open. So you have has to cover your mouth and your nose. And when you're removing it. Sorry, when you're removing it, just uh, important to like take it off without trying to touch, without touching the mask and touching your face. So by the you know by the ears, and again that goes back to maybe the initially why the WHO was initially not saying not to wear masks because it's not a mask isn't benign. You know you can certainly uh, you know touch 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 it, it, for it increases your touching your face for example or you know people and people also sometimes have this false like you mentioned this false sense of like safety like no now I'll stay and talk to my friend longer. And now I'll do all, you know, because I'm, I feel protected of wearing the mask while I'm touching my face and rubbing my nose that is bothering me. So, you know, wearing a, ma a mask, you know, again, isn't completely benign and, you know, it has to be done properly. Can we just, Joe, you were talking about food in the freezer and in the fridge and stuff. Um, I've heard a bunch of things about people, you know, ordering and take out and they feel much safer when they're in something hot, whether it's pizza, they could then stick the pizza oven in the box for like nuke it or whatever for 10 minutes versus ordering a, a, some type of salad or something that's prepared. The cold food versus the hot yeah. food. Uh, this, this really is not much of an issue because this is a respiratory virus. It's not a question of the food being contaminated and you getting sick because you've eaten food that has virus, virus in it. We have absolutely no evidence that, that there's any sort of transmission of this virus through eating. So whether it's the cold food or the hot food uh, doesn't matter. Now, I, I imagine, you know, let's say you have a salad and someone sneezed into the salad, you know, and then it was delivered to you and then you handle the salad and you touch your face. That's a possible conveyance, but not by eating it. So I, I don't. The temperature really there. It doesn't. It doesn't Even happen. then, there's like three steps there that the virus has to survive before, it like you know, the, the sneezing on the salad, the delivery, the getting onto your hand, and then getting into your nose. Yeah. Is, uh, you know. I, I think that people are just over concerned about this delivery business and, and you know disinfecting absolutely everything. I, I just want to go. Would you be sorry? Yeah. Well, what I, I you have to be concerned yeah. about is, is someone breathing on you, someone sneezing at you, someone coughing at you, uh, <clears throat> a dead body exhaling breath onto the mortician <laughs> if they push the chest. Those are concerns, but, but uh, the food, no. I just want to go, before we wrap up, because I think we're coming to that time, there's some back and forth about the, the estrogen question that was asked, and you answered with some endocrine-disrupting um, answer, and maybe you could just, maybe I... Want to re-clarify the question, and maybe you could re-clarify or confirm your answer. Okay. Um, so they were saying phytoestrogens are protective in uh, HERS breast cancers because it blocks those receptor the receptor site. With COVID nineteen, since estrogen appears certainly appears to be protective, could estrogen or phytoestrogen foods help or hurt? This has nothing to do with endo endocrine disruption. Or Yes, it does have to do with endocrine disruption. That's exactly what they're okay, so describing. So maybe maybe they don't understand that that, that the estrogen yeah. equals estrogen that. is a hormone. Estrogen is a hormone, and it fits into receptor sites on cells and activates the cells machinery in, in various ways. Hormone disrupting chemicals are ones that fit into the same receptors and activate the the cell, and at the same time block real estrogen from fitting in. This is a concern in some cancers, especially in breast cancer, but this has nothing to do with COVID. 
the, the receptors on cells for the COVID virus, the so-called ACE2 receptors, have nothing to do with estrogen receptors. So estrogen cannot fit into those receptors. So there's just no connection here uh, whatsoever. And finally, talking about something else that there's no, no connection. Uh, one of the, the uh, uh, interesting instructions that was put out uh, in New York, where they put out a brochure about what to do uh, in order to protect yourself, uh, they say that uh, uh, your best lover is yourself. And uh, what they're talking about there is that obviously if you engage in physical contact with others, you're increasing the risk. But this has been misinterpreted by a lot of people because there was some silly study that came out that showed that uh, people who engage in the activity that was made so famous in that Seinfeld episode uh, called the contest, uh, that this particular activity increases the uh, number of white blood cells in your system. And therefore, this is a way of protecting yourself from COVID. Well, no, there's no truth to this. Uh, the, that particular activity, this uh, what has been called self-abuse, uh, although not a term used these days, but in the 1800s, that's the term that was used. Uh, no, this is not going to have any protective uh, effect against the COVID virus. And of course, if you have been living in the same house with someone and neither of you are infected, you do not have to worry about uh, getting close to, to that person. So there's a lot of lunacy that is uh, out there. But uh, no, you're, you're not going to uh, increase your white blood cells and protect yourself by uh, playing with yourself. Okay, so we've covered a lot of uh, territory there. And uh, we've seen that a lot of this is sort of new stuff since last week. And I'm sure that by next week, we will have uh, some more new stuff that uh, comes up. But in the meantime, you can always send us questions. Uh, you can email them directly. Uh, we uh, at McGill, we all have the same email, uh, first name, dot second name at uh, mcgill.ca. So it's joe.schwartz at mcgill.ca. And of course, you can go to our website. Uh, which is uh, mcgill.ca slash OSS, where you can see our discussions and you will also see this one. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, chiming in and for uh, hopefully uh, we have been informative and maybe even given you a little bit of uh, entertainment to take your mind off of some of the uh, seriousness of uh, COVID-19. And we'll see you here next week. Until then. Have a great rest of your life. Thumbs up. That's right. Thank you.